Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Welcome back and we are continuing our lectures in the Random Signal Theory course and today we start a new chapter, chapter six, which has the title Descriptive Statistics. So before we start with the actual topic, let me make a motivation that will also connect this chapter with the chapters before. So to do that, I would like to tell you about the population and the sample. So what is the population exactly? The population is basically containing all values that we're interested in. So let's mention one specific example. Imagine that, for example, we are focusing on the customer waiting times at a specific check-in counter. So we have the airport, we have one of the specific check-in counters, and we are observing how long are people waiting until they check in. So let's call that the customer waiting times. So what is the population? The population contains all waiting times of all the customers that went through this check-in counter. All the customers could be millions, could be billions of customers. So basically, the population contains all different customer waiting times for all customers. So for that specific example, okay? In regards to the same example, if we're focusing on waiting times, what is the sample? The sample is a small part taken from the population. So the sample in this context would be the waiting times for a finite group of selected customers. Imagine that I wait, I stand at this check-in counter, and then I observe 20 customers. I observe 20 customers only, and for each one of the 20 customers, I have a waiting time. So my sample contains only 20 waiting times out of the population. Let me mention another example. Let's say we are focusing on how tall are men above 18 years old? Let's say for all men above 18 years old, how tall are they? Of course, this is something random. It changes from person to person. But if we have the population, it means the population contains the heights of every single man above 18 years old. So that could contain billions of values. So the population contains how tall is every single man above 18 years old? What would be a sample? Imagine I go to the street and then I choose a group of 150 men above 18 years old and for each one I know how tall they are and this represents my sample. So the population contains all the data, contains all the data like the heights of every single person above 18 years old or it contains the waiting time of every single customer at the check-in counter that I'm interested in, and the sample contains only some values of a group that we select from the population, like the waiting times of a specific group of the customers, or the heights of a specific group of my men that I am observing, and so on. So this is just the population versus the sample. The population contains everything, and the sample is just a subset chosen from the population, which is finite. It's much smaller. Now, what is the problem with the population? The problem with the population that it might not be known or it's really large, it's almost impossible to find. Like if I'm interested in, let's say I want to ask you a question, what is the average height among all men above 18 years old? What is the exact average? How can you calculate this average exactly? So one of the ways is that we know the entire population. So I know the height of every single man above 18 years old. So this means that I know the population. If I know the population, I can calculate that average. Or I know the random variable. Now this is the relation to what we have studied before. Or I know the random variable that models the population. So let's say I have a waiting, I have a check-in counter, sorry, I have a check-in counter and I'm interested in the waiting time of people at that check-in counter. So instead of knowing the actual waiting time of every single one who moved through the check-in counter, no, I know the random variable that models this. So let's say I know that the waiting times in general have an exponential distribution with lambda equals to so-and-so. So I know the random variable. Knowing the random variable Although it does not mean I know the population explicitly, but I know the model for the population. So knowing the population or the random variable, let's say I'm interested in, as another example, I'm interested in the GPA of every individual student in the second year, in the world, in all world universities. I want to know what is the average GPA of all second year students in all the universities in the world. 
To get this average, either I have to know the population exactly, so I need to know the GPA of every single student in every single university, and this might contain millions of values, or I know the random variable that models this. Let's say I know that the GPAs in general follow a normal distribution with mu equals to so-and-so, and standard deviation sigma equals to so-and-so. So knowing the random variable is equivalent to knowing the population. In other words, if the random variable is known, let's say x is known, I know it's a normal distribution or a Poisson or an exponential and so on. In our previous chapters, as for example, we calculated the expected value of x, which we call mu as well. So that expected value of x, it's a mean, it's a mean, but the question is, is this mean expected value of x as, as long as we use the random variable itself? Is this mean for the population or for a specific small sample? No, that mean is for the population. So that expected value of x, as long as we know the variable exactly with all its parameters, like if it's an exponential distribution, I know exactly lambda, or if it's a normal distribution, I know exactly uh, sigma and mu. If I calculate the expected value of x or mu, we call that the population mean. That's the exact average of the entire population. However, if the population is not known, neither explicitly nor the random variable that models the population is known. In that case, I have to work with a small sample. Let's say I'm, I'm interested in the waiting times at a check-in counter. I don't know the random variable x and I don't know the population because it's really large. However, I observe the next 30 customers and for each customer, I calculate the waiting time. Using a timer, I calculate the waiting time. It means I have 30 different times, so 30 different numbers and each number represents a waiting time. Now, if I calculate the average, let's call it x bar. So x bar is the average of my sample and this is what we call the sample mean which is really the average value for the finite sample. So this is just a contrast so that we enter this subject so that we understand the relationship between the population and the sample. So in the previous chapters, we dealt with a random variable. We calculated things like the expected value of x or the variance of x. All these values are exact. They represent the whole population, but if the population is not known and then we have just a small sample from the population and then we need to calculate things for that sample like the average or like the standard deviation or the variance, but these are observations for the sample. They're not observations for the whole population, so we have to distinguish between the sample mean and the population mean. So the population mean is the average of the entire population. Alternatively, if we know the random variable that models the population, so it's the expected value of x using the style of chapters three or four, whether it's discrete or continuous. However, if we have a small sample, then we calculate only the average for the sample and we call that the sample mean. So in this chapter, we have the following context. We say x is a random variable which represents a population. X is a random variable which represents a population, but from that random variable X, or equivalently from the population, we may choose a sample, let's say X1, X2, until Xn. This is a sample that we might choose at random from the population. So this is a sample, a finite sample that we take from the population. Now in the context of our waiting times at a check-in counter example, what do we mean here exactly? If we take a sample of size N, what does that mean? It means that X1 is the waiting time of the first customer in the sample, X2 is the waiting time of the second customer in the sample, and so on. Xn is the waiting time of the nth customer in the sample. At the end of the day, once we talk about a sample and not the entire population, what we have is just a bunch of numbers. It is just a group of numbers, and this is what the sample is. Now, let's go back to our slides. Okay, so to put you back in the context, in this chapter, we are, we are dealing with a sample that has been chosen from a larger population, X1, X2, until Xn. Do you notice the small letters, X1, X2, until Xn? Because we assume in this chapter is that the sample has been chosen already. So we have chosen the sample, so we have a given sample, we have a fixed sample, X1 has a value, X2 has a value, Xn has a value, so at the end we have n values that represents a sample. 
from a larger population. As a reminder, as I've mentioned also in the previous slide, random variable x is a model for the population. So knowing the population explicitly or knowing a random variable x is pretty much the same thing. If we talk about the expected value of x or mu, then we are talking about the average of the population itself, and we call it the population mean. However, if we talk about x bar, which represents the average of the observed sample, we call that the sample mean. Now, the main question in this chapter, how do we calculate the sample mean? If we have a sample, x1, x2, until xn. If we have this sample that has been taken from a population, and the sample in this chapter is just given. So what we have is just a bunch of numbers. How do we calculate the sample mean? I think this is very old information. The only additional thing that we have done today is the relationship. What does this sample represent towards a population, and what is the role of a random variable? However, if we have just a sample, if we just have a sample, how do we calculate the sample mean x bar? It is simply the summation of the observations in the sample, so x1 added to x2, added to x3, and so on, and then at the end added to xn, and then dividing by n, dividing by how many? By the size of the sample, basically, dividing by how many observations we have in the sample. So in short, the sample mean is calculated as the summation of the, va of the values xi for i equals to one until n, divided by n. Let's see an example here. So imagine that we have a sample uh, that has the values x1 is equal to 12.6, x2 is equal to 12.9, x3 is equal to 13.4, and so on, until x8 is equal to 13.1. So this is our sample that has been taken from a larger population. However, here we are just given the sample, and the question is very simple, what is the value of the sample mean? So x bar, what is the value of the sample mean? By just applying this formula, the sample mean is simply x1 plus x2 plus plus until plus xn divided by n. So for this example, the sample mean is simply 12.6 plus 12.9 plus 13.4 plus plus and so on until plus 13.1 divided by eight because our sample here in this example has a size of eight. Our sample has eight observations and if you do the calculation, the answer is 13, so 13 is the sample mean of the sample given in this question. How can you interpret the sample mean? It's an average value, so if you look at these green dots, if each one of the green dots represents an observation in the sample, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, this is our sample. Now the sample mean, which has a value of 13, you can think of it as the point, basically, the point on the number line that balances these observations. So it's an average, it's an average really. Okay, so let's go to the next concept. So what else should we be able to calculate for a sample? If we have a sample, x1, x2, x3, until xn, in addition to the sample mean that we call x bar, we also need to calculate the sample variance, which is given the symbol s square. Notice s square and not sigma square. Sigma square, basically is reserved for the population mean. That's the variance of the random variable. It is the actual variance of the entire population. It is the exact variance. Now, if we have a finite sample, then the sample variance S square is given by this formula. So this is the definition of the sample variance. It's a summation for I equals one to N. What are we adding up in each term? we are subtracting xi. xi is basically the observation, so x1 in the first term, x2 in the second term, and so on. We are subtracting xi from the sample mean, and then this difference is squared, and we add up for all values of i, at the end we divide by n minus one. That's the definition of the sample variance. You may ask me why do we divide by n minus one? Why not divide it by n? That's an alternative definition of the sample variance. So this is the sample variance definition based on dividing by n minus one. We could have an alternative definition based on dividing by n. It would give you a slightly different value. However, for reasons that you will learn in chapter seven, in the next chapter, dividing by n minus one has an advantage that will come up later. Okay, so here in this chapter, the sample variance has this definition. S square is the summation i from one until n, 
xi minus x bar square, and then we add up all these difference terms. At the end, we divide by n minus 1. Let's have a look at an example to see how we do that calculation. And the best way to show it is basically using this table. So uh, by doing a table like this, it's very easy to calculate the sample variance. And we are still talking about the same previous example in which we calculated the sample mean. So our sample that is given in the question is exactly the same. So we have a sample of size eight. So our sample contains one, two, three until eight observations. And these observations are 12.6, 12.9, 13.4, and so on until 13.1. So you can check the previous slide that has the previous example. These are exactly the same numbers for which we calculated the sample mean. How did we calculate the sample mean? We added all these numbers up, which was 104, and then divided by 8 gives you 13. So this was the sample mean. Now, if you just have a quick peek again at the sample variance equation, what do we need to get for the sample variance? We need to subtract x bar from each xi. So let's introduce a column here. So we have a column xi minus x bar. How did we get x bar? We have to do it separately on the side. So we have to calculate x bar by adding up all the xi values, which gives you 104 in this example, and then dividing by 8. So dividing by n in general would give us x bar. So in this example, x bar is equal to 13. Now, how do we get the values in this column xi minus x bar? So 12.6 minus 13, it is negative 0 0.4. 12.9 minus 13, negative 0 0.1. 13.4 minus 13, 0 0.4, and so on. Finally, if you check 13.1 minus 13 is 0 0.1. So each one of these values represents one of the terms xi minus x bar in the sample variance, xi minus x bar. But to calculate the sample variance, do we need xi minus x bar itself, or is it really xi minus x bar squared? It's xi minus x bar squared. So that's why we have a third column here, which is xi minus x bar squared. How did we come up with these values? We're just squaring this value that we have obtained before. Zero, minus 0 0.4 squared is 0 0.16. Minus 0 0.1 squared is 0 0.01. 0 0.1 squared is 0 0.01. And then we add all the values. When we add all the values, which has a numerical value of 1.6, in this example, what does this 1.6 represent in the sample variant equation? It represents the value of the numerator of what you have in top here. It is the summation of the xi minus x bar squared for all the terms. So what else do we need to do so that we calculate the sample variance? We have to divide this value by n minus 1. So in the previous example, n was 8, n minus 1 is 7. So that's why the sample variance for this question is 1.6 divided by 7. Let me show you here. This is the complete solution depending on this table. So S squared, the sample variance, is 1.6 over 7, which is 0 0.2286. So this number here represents the variance of our sample, of our sample that has a size of 8. Now, if we need the standard deviation, if S squared is the sample variance, then the sample standard deviation is simply the square root of this value, which is 0 0.48 in this example. Now, if you continue with the slides, you will find another alternative formula for S square. So S square can also be calculated by doing this summation from, y, from one, summation for i equals to one until n, xi squared. So what is the xi squared? It is the square of the sample value itself. So we add up all xi squared, and here, we add all the xi's, just adding the xi's, and then we square the sum and we divide by n. So if you do it for the previous example, we divide this by 8, and then we subtract these two values. At the end, we, subtract, we divide by n minus 1. We divide by 7 if you want to do it for the previous example. Now, although this formula looks more complicated, actually this formula is exactly equivalent to the previous one. So this formula here and this formula are equivalent. We can show mathematically, we can show analytically that this formula is exactly the same as the other one. However, you might think, why are we studying this? 
the other one looks easy and we can apply it easily using a table like that. Why are you mentioning this formula? Actually, the only reason is that this formula, this alternative formula, has basically one computational advantage. Look at the subtractions here. How many times did we have to subtract if we want to use this formula? How many times did we have to subtract? We have xi minus x bar, and this applies i equals to 1 until n. So we have to subtract n times. So here when we applied the original formula for each xi, we have xi minus x bar. x bar was 13 in this example, so we had to subtract 12.6. Minus 13. Now the problem is that subtraction is harder than addition numerically, and it can also lead to a number that has many digits. Here everything was nice because x bar was 13, so 12.6 minus 13 was minus 0 0.4. But what if x bar itself has many digits? So if you subtract, you will get many digits. So how many digits will you keep if you want to be precise? You have to deal with a lot of digits. This is one way you can think about it. So applying this formula, applying this formula is perhaps computationally a little bit complex because we have to do many subtractions. We have to do n subtractions, and for each subtraction, it's possible that we get a number that has many digits, so we have to keep a lot of digits so that we get an accurate solution. However, the alternative formula has only one subtraction, although the formula itself looks more complicated, but applying it is actually easier because we have only one subtraction. So this is an addition, and this is also an addition, and then we have only one subtraction. So from the computational complexity point of view, this one is less complex because we have to do only one subtraction. It's also easier to get more accurate solution because we have only one subtraction. So that difficulty of dealing with many digits uh, is basically less difficult because we do it only once. However, for this course, do you must use this? Actually, no, as long as we have only a few numbers. Uh, so for the exam purposes, maybe we have to deal with quite small samples. And for small samples, doing a table like this, which means applying the original formula, is not hard at all. Okay? So let's put everything in context. This formula is exactly equivalent to the other one. It has a computational advantage. However, it's not necessary that you use it. Using the first one is sufficient for us. Now we have one last definition, which is also uh, really old for you. Uh, if we have a sample which contains n observations, so we have a sample x1, x2, and so on until xn. If we have such a sample, what did we learn in this chapter? We learned how to calculate the sample mean by adding them all up and then dividing by n. We learned how to calculate the sample variance by applying the formula using that table that we have seen a couple of slides ago. And then our third definition that we're interested in is the sample range. So what is the sample range? The sample range is simply the maximum of the xi's minus the minimum of the xi. So if we have a sample, if we have a sample, the largest number in the sample is max xi, and the smallest number in the sample is min xi, and then the difference is called the range. So let's apply this quickly to our example here. If this is our sample, 12.6, 12.9, and so on until 13.1. What is the range of this sample? The range of this sample is the largest number minus the smallest number. What is the largest number in this sample? Let's have a look here. 13.6, do we have any number bigger than 13.6? No, we don't, so this is the maximum value. What about the minimum value? I see 12.3, uh, do we have anything smaller than 12.3? 12.6 and so on, 12.3, we don't have anything smaller. So uh, the range here would be 13.6 minus 12.3, which is 1.3. This is the range, it is the difference between the largest value minus the smallest value in our sample, and this finishes uh, our part that we cover in this chapter. Thank you so much, and see you in the next lecture for Chapter 7, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum.